What I want to talk to you about very briefly is uh, some of the work that um, got motivated uh, by s kinds of sensor networks, IoT type of applications, basically by realization that there are all these big machines, um, infrastructure things that we are building and we can put tons of sensors on them to kind of sense them and try to understand them. And in particular, we are motivated by two, two collaborations we have. One is with a big uh, um, airplane manufacturer. Uh, airplane will have around 20,000 sensors and it's, it's reading everything at about between 10 to 60 uh, times uh, uh, a second. Uh, and you can get lots and lots of that data. Another example will be from um, uh, driving from cars. An average car today will have around 1,400 sensors, again, sensing everything from the uh, air conditioning temperature to the radio volume to all the inputs of the driver, uh, temperature of your seat, and so on and so forth. Right? And the way we'll think of this as this kind of massive streams of data coming, uh, coming at us at high velocity. And the question is, how do we go and understand these types of, these types of data? Right? Like if I get a uh, 20,000 dimensional vector 10 times or 60 times a second, what can I, what can I do with this? Right? And this data is, is very challenging because it's unstructured. It's super high dimensional. It's unlabeled. The velocity of it is amazing. It's very heterogeneous. You have sensors that are giving you readings all the time. You have sensors that are not reading anything for a very long time. Issues are around the fact that sensors might fail, uh, that there are environment conditions, and so on and so forth. So these things become very challenging if you want to um, uh, do, do, do things with such data. So the reason why it's very hard to obtain insights with these kinds of floods of data is that sensor readings are interdependent and correlated with one another, is that there is kind of external pressures and ex external influences and changes um, that change the way the sensors are reading and the way the sensors are related. Uh, sensors might fail, um, and uh, readings might be asynchronous, meaning not all sensors are synch synchronized. They read at different frequencies and so on and so forth. And then kind of one of the challenge, you have two big challenges. One is even how could you build analytics on top of this that would allow you to understand what is happening with your system? So this will be question number one. And then question number two is if you want to do machine learning on these types of data, then kind of you, you are doomed doing feature engineering for the rest of your life and making no progress, right? So that's kind of the, the, two, the two problems. So what I will talk to you is give you two examples about um, how do we deal with these types of uh, large-scale time series data. One will be about how do we gain any kind of insights into it, kind of that are un understandable, interpretable. And the other one, how can we make uh, effective predictions? So first is about discovering structure um, in, time, in large-scale time series data motivated by this type of sensor network, IoT type applications. So here what we'd like to do, maybe this cartoon tries to explain this best, is that if you have this stream of time series data coming in, what you'd like to do is you'd like to break it down into a sequence of states. And you'd like to discover what those states are. And if you can think of, let's say, a three-dimensional time series that is measuring someone's, um, someone's uh, uh, vital uh, functions behavior, you could imagine that I want to go and break this down into walking and running and sitting and you know, more running and so on. And I want to discover what does walking mean? What does running mean? What does sitting mean? And sitting mean means that you know, maybe your heart rate goes down, your breathing is kind of slow, and you have zero steps. And running means heart rate goes up, you are breathing faster, and uh, you know, your, uh, your step counts are going up higher. Right? And these are just anecdotes, but the idea is if I get like hordes of this unlabeled, unstructured sensor network data, can I, can I come up with these types of insights? So I want to do two things. I want to discover the states, and I want to be able to describe each of the states. So the first thing is, how are we going to describe the states? The way we are going to describe the states is to identify dependency networks. So what I want to do is I want to take this big time series and segment, segment it into states. And for every state, I want to learn the dependency network between my readings. So I can say how things are correlated or related dependent uh, through this, uh, throughout this time series. And we won't only learn the dependencies 
between the between the sensors uh, at a given time, but we will learn these types of multi-layer networks where I can learn dependencies both inside a given timestamp. So the idea is that these are the, this is the dependencies between sensors in in a given timestamp. But there are also dependencies across time that say high reading on this sensor means low reading on that sensor, I don't know, three time units later. And then now basically what we, this will allow me to do is to identify these types of states of the system. And for every state I will have, I will be able to look at this network and say this is how your sensors readings are related in uh, when you are in this type of a state. And this is how sensors are interdependent inside the timestamps and also across the times. And we have a, a scalable, um, uh, theoretically justifiable and sound way to do this by basically defining a big um, um, co convex optimization type problem where we are doing both the segmentation of the time series into states and learning these types of uh, dependency networks. And here is too, math, too much math to explain and I won't go into this, but we can formulate this as an um, optimization problem, and we actually have a convex optimization solver based on the um, uh, ADMM method that allows us to scale to, to very big problems, right? We can, we can learn problems with tens of millions of unknowns much, much faster than, for example, what a, a standard um, solver like CVX Pi would be able uh, to do. And so our ADMM uh, based as open source and allows us to solve uh, these types of problems. And just as a quick kind of small case study, I'll show you one example when we are looking at people driving cars and, and just for interpretability reasons, we have selected seven sensors from a standard car. So this is about brake pedal position, accelerations, steering wheel angle, velocity, engine RPM, and, and gas pedal positions. And I'll show you kind of real um, the results later, but here are kind of some of the anecdotes you learn from this data. For example, if you have a car that's driving on a road and it's, and it's in the middle of the turn, then you kind of know that, you know, uh, in, in the time now and in the time, let's say, a tenth of a second from now, the, the position of the brake and the, the position of the steering wheel are intimately related, right? And if they wouldn't be, you wouldn't be driving and you'd be off the, off the road. Right? So really what this allows us to do is to discover these types of networks of dependencies, both to understand and be able to describe what the state is. Another thing this allows us to do is it allows us to, un to, to capture the way people drive cars so that you could say, if I'm building a uh, self-driving car, I want it to drive like a human. Here is how the, uh, how the, how the human uh, drives. And uh, um, this is basically, um, the idea. And what is interesting is if we apply this to, to driving data, here I have a picture of a road and here are the states we discover. And in one case, the person was going, driving up and in the other case, the person was driving straight. But if we say, I give you five states, how do you explain driving? Then here are the, the five states we discover. Um, driving straight, uh, breaking before the turn, making the turn, accelerating after the turn. And, and you know, turning right or turning left looks, about, looks the same to us. It's, these are kind of the five states that are both interpretable. We understand the structure and, and they make sense. And of course, we can do this in a hierarchical way, uh, way and slice it down into much finer way to understand what are the states of the system through the eyes of the sensors. So that's the first application I want to talk about. The second application I want to talk about is, is, is about can I use this time series to, to make predictions about the future but without doing feature engineering. Um, and here the application is to, uh, again, to the car. And basically what I want to do is I want to predict what are you, go what are you going to do a, a second from now. And in particular, I want to predict this kind of safety critical events that may happen. And really, I wouldn't think of this as a prediction task. I would almost think of it as a detection task, right? I need to detect whether you will turn on the blinker before you actually turn it on. I, I would like to detect whether you, would, you will accelerate quickly before you actually do it, because maybe I want to prep the engine that it will be ready for you to enjoy the, the horses under the hood, right? Or I may want to detect that you are about to slam the, the brake pedal so that I can get the car ready or I can even start doing it before, before you do it. And here we built 
both the system that allows us to work with, with data, we are processing 150 billion uh, data points, so 3,000 hours of driving um, times this many sensors times this many hertz gives you lots and lots of data. And we both kind of build the system that allows us to manipulate this uh, time series, as well as coming up with a novel neural network architecture where basically we can stack these LSTMs together to get really good uh, predictive performance. Um, I'll, I'll skip what exactly we do. But the point is that, for example, for slamming the brake, the brake pedal, we can make this prediction, um, even though this is an extremely rare event, we can make detect it um, quite accurately with AUC of 0.93. And actually, we have a little demo uh, that I want to show you next, the video, where this is a car. And uh, here we are making predictions what is about to happen, and then it happens, right? So we were predicting that the person will turn on the blinker, and they turned on the blinker. We were predicting they will turn on, they will press the brake, and they do it, right? So when you see, for example, this is when we predict the left blinker, and then the blinker happened. Now we are predicting brake, and the brake happens, right? And, and, and we can do this with um, high accuracy. So, um, I think I'm kind of, to, to wrap up, what I wanted to show is basically that we have these complex engineered systems, infrastructure we build, machines we build, air conditioning devices, boilers, cars, uh, aeroplanes, that are this kind of full of high dimensional, unlabeled time series data collected in real time. And the question really is, how can we do analytics and do predictions on top of this data, both to understand what is the structure of these systems and what is their behavior, as well as uh, making accurate predictions. And, and we've been kind of investing with the, with the students um, in this direction uh, quite a lot. One problem we are looking at right now is to see whether we can do what is known as root cause analysis, where you want to identify what are the sequences of critical events that lead to something bad happening. And can we kind of almost like identify in a purely data-driven way, what are the crisis scenarios? And you know, in kind of, in which movie are you right now? And at what stage? And what has to happen for the explosion to happen at the end, right? And if you have this, if you can, in a data-driven way, identify these critical scenarios and and tell you, you are here. This this is what what is about to happen. If this happens, here are your options. Um, then we can really help, for example, in servicing these systems or being able to predict uh, their behavior in the future. Um, so with this, I'm done. Happy to take a question or two. Do you have any questions? John? <laughs> I see you standing up over there. <laughs> oh, just a, a curiosity. You had seven sensors. And it didn't look that hard. Tell us about 1,400 um, in the car. Yes. So there are, there are two, two, two things, right? Like when you want to understand things, you want to prune things, prune, things, prune things down. So there are ways how, how in an automatic way we can kind of identify what are the core sensors that, that you can do. And we pick seven just because it was easy. We could have picked more. Um, and the way we really think of that is, if you are a, an analyst, a data a, a scientist, you want to understand the behavior of your system. So there is kind of some level, you know, your human cognitive capacity limit, how much you can understand. So there, we wanted to work with small data in some sense. Uh, and also the methods we develop there are kind of more expensive. But we can do this. The, the networks we can infer, we can infer them up to around 20,000 nodes. Um, uh, and, and the parameter space, right, it's 20,000 times 20 for every time step. So it's a lot of stuff you are computing over. For the, the second part, there you, you don't care how, how about the interpretability or why. You just care about can, can you do it. And then you, you build the system differently. You build it for kind of velocity and data and being able to, to build big models in a, in, a, in, a, in a proper way to be able to make predictions. Thank Dan, you. do you want to come set up and while we finish with questions? Uh, our questions um, in your case of the time series data, is the data uh, numeric data, labels, or uh, structures? Uh, all data, so none of this data is labeled. It is just sequences of 
of uh, readings. Some of the readings are, are real valued, some readings are categorical, and sometimes we would be lucky to know what the sensor is. But most often we wouldn't even know that. Okay, and then the other questions I have is that when you're trying to find relationship between these uh, different time series, uh, you, you're using some kind of like correlations or? Yes, so what I'm, what I'm really inferring, I didn't say that, I'm inferring inverse covariance matrices. An inverse covariance matrix, what it basically means, it, it allows you to quantify um, conditional dependencies and conditional independence, independencies, right? So two nodes are, um, are uh, 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 connected if they are correlated or dependent on one another, and if the edge is missing, this means two, these two things are independent given everything else. So there is a proper probabilistic interpretation of these networks. All right, thank you, good question. Yeah. Uh, sir, thank you for a great talk. Um, real quick uh, question about, I'm an uh, experimental test pilot in the Air Force, so this is near and dear to my heart. Um, have you partnered with anyone uh, beyond the, uh, the automobile driving piece? Because this is a problem that we address on a daily basis and, and are not really sure how to resolve the sheer magnitude of what we're, we're dealing with. And we're missing probably an awful lot because we don't have these uh, sorts of processes implemented right now. Um, so we are, we are working with uh, the guys in Seattle who are building planes. Um, they, uh, there we have uh, some sensor data um, and we were looking at predicting failures of ailerons or something. Yeah, so I right. don't know, but you know. Um, um, and uh, there the, 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 issues, the issues are with uh, how often this happens because these are rare events. So they are kind of hard, like breaking happens quite often. So you see the labels and nothing bad happens. The problem in aviation is that when something happens, it's usually a bad thing. So we are working with them, uh, but that's yet to come. Are you interested to work with anyone else? Yes, we are, of course. Those guys do kind of the same airplane over and over and over, right? No, we, I mean, uh, we are very to... interested in working <laughs> with anyone who has real problems. So we tend that's, to fly airplanes that's that Sorry? break a little bit more often. And get that, that'd be great. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, all right. Give me you. things that break, and I'll break them more. All right, thank you.